Thank you all for being here. Today, Baltimore finds itself at the epicenter of a national conflict between urban and rural populations of color and the law enforcement agencies that are sworn to protect and serve them. It is a struggle that strikes at the basic ideas of self-determination, justice, equality, and sadly, humanity in America. However fitting it is for observers to use the untimely death of Freddie Carlos Gray Jr. as a barometer of our nation's progress on police brutality, my professional role in this matter is plain, to seek justice on behalf of an innocent 25-year-old man who was unreasonably taken into custody after fleeing in his neighborhood, which just happens to be a high crime neighborhood and had his spine partially severed in the back of a Baltimore police wagon. As the chief prosecutor for Baltimore City, I took an oath to uphold justice and to treat every individual within my jurisdiction equally and fairly under the law. I take my oath very seriously. Since the start of my administration, we have been and continue to be wholly committed to creating a fair and equitable justice system for all and holding people accountable for crimes that they commit regardless of age, race, color, sex, creed, socioeconomic status, or in this case, occupation. As a chief prosecutor elected by the people of Baltimore City, I made a promise that my prosecutors and I will never cower from our obligation to prosecute crimes where we believe that we have probable cause that a crime was committed. We're sworn to not only uphold the law and hold violent repeat offenders accountable, but we're also sworn to apply justice fairly and equally to everyone, even those that take an oath to protect and serve our communities. As prosecutors, we are servants of all victims and witnesses of crime in Baltimore City, and we fight each and every day to ensure that perpetrators of crime see their day in court and are held accountable for their actions or inactions where there's a relational duty that requires such. We never cowered in our battle for justice for 16-year-old Felicia Barnes, one-year-old Carter Scott, bicyclist and loving father Thomas Palermo, or Shatia Lansdowne and the various other sexual assault survivors of Nelson Clefford. As I previously stated, the decision to prosecute six police officers was not and has never been an indictment on the entire Baltimore Police Department. Although some have tried to invalidate my family's long-standing service as public officers, I know firsthand the sacrifices, the dedication, the commitment it takes to protect and serve our communities. For those that believe that I'm anti-police, it's simply not the case. I'm anti-police brutality, and I need not... I need not remind you that the only loss and the greatest loss in all of this was that of Freddie Gray's life. For over a year, my office has been forced to remain silent on all six of the cases pertaining to and surrounding the death of Freddie Gray. Despite being physically and professionally threatened, mocked, ridiculed, harassed, and even sued, we've respected and fulfilled our obligation and dutiful silence in accordance with Judge Barry Williams' gag order restricting any commentary from the state. In accordance with my oath to pursue justice over convictions, I've refused to allow the grandstanding of some and the hyperbole of others to diminish our resolve to seek justice on behalf of this young man. I was elected the prosecutor. I signed up for this and I can take it. Because, because no matter how problematic and troublesome it has been for my office, my prosecutors, my family, and me personally, it pales in comparison to what mothers and fathers all across this country, specifically Freddie Gray's mother, Gloria Darden, or Richard Shipley, Freddie Gray's stepfather, goes through on a daily basis, knowing their son's mere decision to run from the police proved to be a lethal one. Please know that even though the media has made this about everything but the untimely death of your son, my office has never wavered in our commitment to seeking justice on his behalf. My team of prosecutors, led by two highly respected veteran attorneys, Chief Deputy Michael Schatzow, Deputy State's Attorney Janice Bledsoe, right here, and Assistant State's Attorney John Butler, Matt Pillion, Sarah Akhtar, Law Clerk Michael Fiorenza have devoted countless hours and make countless sacrifices to ensure accountability on your son's behalf. I'm extremely proud of my team who never lost sight of why we were fighting so hard, your son. As the world has witnessed over the past 14 months, the prosecution of on-duty police officers in this country 
is unsurprisingly rare and blatantly fraught with systemic and inherent complications. Yes, it is. Unlike with other cases where prosecutors work closely with the police to investigate what actually occurred, what we realized very early on in this case was that police investing, investigating police, whether they're friends or merely their colleagues, was problematic. That's right. That's right. There was a reluctance and an obvious bias that was consistently exemplified not by the entire Baltimore Police Department, but by individuals within the Baltimore Police Department at every stage of the investigation, which became blatantly apparent in the subsequent trials. Although Commissioner Davis was and has been extremely accommodating, there were individual police officers, there were individual police officers that were witnesses to the case, yet were part of the investigative team. Interrogations that were conducted without asking the most poignant questions. Lead detectives that were completely uncooperative and started a counter investigation to disprove the state's case by not executing search warrants pertaining to text messages among the police officers involved in the case, creating videos to disprove the state's case without our knowledge, creating notes that were drafted after the case was launched to contradict the medical examiner's conclusion, turning these notes over to defense attorneys months prior to turning them over to the state and yet doing it in the middle of trial. As you can see, whether investigating, interrogating, testifying, cooperating, or even complying with the state, we've all bore witness to an inherent bias that is a direct result of when police police themselves. And despite the challenges of not having an independent investigatory agency to work with us throughout this prosecution, we still are grateful for the opportunity to show the world the reality of the justice system from start to finish. At every step of the way, due process was afforded all of these officers, and the legitimacy of our prosecution efforts were affirmed time and time again. They were affirmed when the court commissioner signed off on the charges that we filed. They were yet again affirmed when we presented our case before a grand jury and secured indictments against all six officers in every charge that we presented to them. Our legal arguments, theories, strategies were affirmed not only in 135 motions in which we successfully overcame, but also in the state's highest court where we battled and ultimately prevailed in compelling the officers to testify against each other. The legitimacy of these charges were even affirmed by the judge after he rejected 13 motions for dismissal and denied 22 motions for judgment of acquittal throughout all four trials. As prosecutors, we are ministers of justice, and it is our ethical obligation to always seek justice over convictions. Yes, As prosecutors, we do not determine guilt or innocence of individuals, but rather present evidence to a judge or a jury to make that determination. In these cases, my prosecutors presented a great deal of evidence to support the charges alleged. And although we came close to convicting one of the officers when his case was tried before 12 Baltimore City residents, the judge, who is within his right, has made it clear that he doesn't agree with the state's theory of the case and does not believe that any of the actions or inactions of these officers rise to the level of criminality. The judge has acquitted three of these officers, one of the arresting officers, the wagon driver, the highest ranking police officer in these matters. In light, in light of these consistent outcomes, the likelihood of the remaining defendant's decision to elect a bench trial with this very same judge is highly probable and unfortunately so is the outcome. And while to this day we stand by the decisions, the legal theories, the charges and assertions set forth in the statement of probable cause and during these proceedings, as officers of the court, we must respect the verdicts rendered by the judge regarding the ultimate culpability of the adjudicated officers involving Freddie Gray's death as final, no matter how much we may disagree with his rulings. We do not believe that Freddie Gray killed himself. We, we stand by the medical examiner's determination that Freddie Gray's death was a homicide. However, 
After much thought and prayer, it has become clear to me that without being able to work with an independent investigatory agency from the very start, without having a say in the election of whether our cases proceed in front of a judge or a jury, without communal oversight of policing in this community, without real substantive reforms to the current criminal justice system, we could try this case a hundred times in cases just like it, and we would still end up with the same result. Accordingly, I have decided not to proceed on the cases against Officer Garrett, Sergeant Alicia White, or to relitigate re the case against William Porter. As a mother, as a mother, the decision not to proceed on these trials, on the remaining trials, is agonizing. However, as a chief prosecutor elected by the citizens of Baltimore, I must consider the dismal likelihood of conviction at this point, the judicial economy in proceeding further, and the divisive impact that continu continuing this prosecution could potentially have on our community. What I've ultimately learned throughout this arduous process is that although no small task, justice is always worth the price paid for its pursuit. You see, in spite of the fact that the verdicts didn't go in our favor, there have been many gains throughout this journey to ensure that what happened to Freddie Gray never happens to another person that comes into contact with police, justifiably or unjustifiably again. Never again should there be a question as to why someone is being stopped, detained, or arrested due to the fact that there will now soon be full implementation of body-worn cameras on all officers. Never again should someone be placed unsecured and defenseless in a metal wagon head first, feet shackled and handcuffed. Due to the fact that officers are now required to secure and seatbelt all prisoners. Never again should there be a need to rely on circumstantial evidence to observe what takes place inside police wagons due to the fact that cameras are now equipped in every one of them. Never again should an officer ignore or neglect a prisoner's request for medical attention to no avail due to the fact that it is now mandatory for officers to call a medic when requested. Never again should a commanding officer or a rank and file officer be able to assert that they are unaware of departmental policies, general orders, or procedures due to the fact that there is now a software verification and accountability system to ensure their adherence. Never again should an officer exhibit a blatant or reckless disregard for human life due to the fact that there are now use of force policies that emphasize the sanctity of life, accentuates de-escalation, and requires that officers intervene if fellow officers cross the line. You see, what I've learned through this experience is that every battle, every hurdle, every obstacle that we've overcome since the pursuit of these cases has brought us one step closer to equality, and that any and every step towards equality in our justice system is well worth fighting for. Uh, this way, system, right. yeah. this system is in need of reform, and when it comes, when it comes to police accountability, and as long as I'm the chief prosecutor for this city, I vow to you that my office and I will fight we will fight for a fair and equitable justice system for all so that whatever happened to Freddie Gray never happens to another person in this community again. Thank you. I'm not taking any questions due to the fact that I have current civil litigation pending against me as a result of this prosecution. God bless you.